The patient I'm going to present today is a, is a real, real life patient. It's a 35 year old obese gentleman who was admitted to our ICU for acute hypoxic respiratory failure, secondary to COVID pneumonia. He was on managed with oxygen, high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation for almost two weeks apart from steroids and the other medications that he would get. Finally, uh, succumbed to respiratory failure, had to be intubated on day 17 of the hospital admission for severe hypoxemia. Post intubation, immediately lung protective ventilation uh, for ARDS with low tidal volumes and optimal PEEP was tried with sedation, deep sedation and paralysis. Really, the hypoxemia did not improve, and then prone, ven prone ventilation was initiated. And the X-ray, you see his, uh, the gentleman's X-ray, completely whited out, and whatever we do probably doesn't work. The first question I'm going to ask Dr. Nick. This is a situation that most of the time that we are called, and at what point here, I've just initiated prone ventilation in this patient, at what point here would you consider ECMO in this particular patient? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I think this is a, such a common case that we've seen over the last few years with, with COVID. But of course, we need to think not just about COVID, but really any form of ARDS, any form of potentially reversible respiratory failure when we're thinking about timing and candidacy for ECMO. So this is a young man who, aside from his obesity, sounds like he's He's relatively well. He's got a fairly common course for COVID, which is to take um, one to two weeks prior to presentation to hospital and then presenting desperately sick, a case I'm sure we all recognize. The really important thing here is that lung protective ventilation has commenced. And the chain to ECMO starts with the patient getting sick and then the initial management. So it's that early phase management with oxygen and then lung protective ventilation, which is so crucial to outcome. Without the lung protective ventilation at the start, the use of prone positioning and other evidence-based therapies, you have very little chance of survival. In terms of the timing as to when, the answer is as early as possible. You don't want to be sitting there with this patient and waiting a week, two weeks, three weeks until the commencement of ECMO. Because although lung protective ventilation is absolutely required and crucial for survival, how protective can it really be in a case with lungs like that? So we need to do the basics well, prone the patient, and then as soon as they meet indications for ECMO with refractory hypoxia, and hypercapnia or inability to provide lung protective ventilation, we need to refer for ECMO within the first few days, ideally. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite Dr. Baba Abraham, uh, our uh, senior intensivist at Apollo Hospital, also to the panel. Would you like to add anything uh, more to Dr. Nick's views, uh, Dr. Babu? Uh, first of all, let me apologize for coming in late. Um, no, I agree completely with, with what Professor Barrett said just now. But just to add on for uh, people who are not doing uh, core critical care, when we say, you know, do uh, the basic lung protective ventilation, when is it that we know that we are crossed that limit and we are now starting to harm our patients? Okay, that's extremely important. So that's when we need to say, okay, now I'm harming my patient, I should get the ECMO team in to start ECMO because I think that's the best way to rest the lung. You have a fractured limb, you won't bear weight on it and keep walking. It will never heal. The same thing with the lung. You have to rest it. So there is clear evidence for lung protective ventilation and prone ventilation. After doing that, when your ventilatory parameters are going beyond a certain uh, level. So at this point of time, we think what the evidence points towards is when you're ventilating a patient and our driving pressure is going above 18 to 20 uh, and you know despite maximizing the peep you get the best peep you got a fio to the highest possible we can we have prone the patient and still we are not able to meet the target of a pf ratio of let's say greater than 80 to 100 
and your pH is sitting as le less than 7.2 with the carbon dioxide of greater than 60 millimeters of mercury with your ventilator setting at a respiratory rate of 30 to 35, I think that's the time we say ECMO team needs to come in. So you do your first proning, second proning, how many ever proning you do, and then your, your targets, are not, targets are not coming down below this, the lung compliance is not improving. Give a call to the ECMO team. What we normally do in, a in our hospital is we have a protocol. We prone the first time. If you see a very good response, then we supine and keep proning. If we don't see a response, even a good response, even with the first proning, we let the ECMO team know that we have a patient, we have proned, we are not seeing the response we are expecting. We want to be aware of the patient. They come and evaluate the patient and are ready to you know, take the patient towards ECMO if the first proning doesn't work and you know, we are planning not to go for the second proning. So as Dr. Professor Barrett said, don't keep doing this for two to three weeks and at the end, mm -hmm. when you've already done a damaging level of ventilation, then push for ECMO, then there's no benefit for uh, ECMO support. We have already done the damage. So, uh, sorry for the formatting. I think it's the Apple to the Windows formatting. Several societies have given guidelines, but in a nutshell, I think all of us would go with a, anybody with a high driving pressure. I think we need to consider severe car pulmonary with refractory shock. These patients may need Murray score at least 2.5 or higher, I think we would consider. And some kind of PF ratio, some people say less than 150, 100. Like I said, the key is if you think you're not going in the right direction, do it sooner than later. But these would be some of the objective criteria that you could use. If it's only hypoxemia, we would go for the veno venous. If there is shock, we are going to support the heart by veno arterial. If there is no hypercapnia, uh, then if there's only hypercapnia, we can probably go for an extracorporeal CO2 removal alone without ECMO, or if there is hypercapnia and hypoxemia, again, we be ECMO. So that's just roughly broadly tells you what kind of ECMOs we use. So second question is to Dr. Selvi, the pulmonologist here. I have put the patient on ECMO. How is ECMO different than a regular ventilator? How does gas exchange happen? If you can just quickly, briefly tell us, and what settings determine your oxygenation and your CO2 removal? So thank you for the question, sir. Actually, in veno venous ECMO, we used to drain the blood from the vena cava. So the blood is passed through the membrane, especially the oxygenator. So in the membrane, the blood is getting oxygenated and also decarboxylated. So the blood is returned to the venous, venous side into the right atrium, following which the blood mixed to the lung. So the arterial PO2 depends upon the uh, oxygenated blood from the circuit along with the uh, deoxygenated or partially oxygenated from blood from the lung. So oxygenation from the patient on VB ECMO depends on the FiO2 settings in the ECMO and also depends upon the blood flow and CO2 removal uh, mainly by the sweep gas flow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Selvi. So just broadly uh, listed the, the determinants of oxygenation and carbon dioxide here. If anybody would like to go into the details, I'm sure there are several reviews out there. So I put the patient on ECMO. The million dollar question is now, what do I do with the ventilator? I mean, we all say rest the lung, rest the lung. But once they are on ECMO, uh, I know this question doesn't have one straight answer. But how do you actually rest the lung, rest the lung practically? Could you tell us what vent settings you would use in these situations, Dr. Barrett? Thank you. Um, so I think this is a really important topic. And actually, the there's not a lot of evidence to guide us. So we don't have the studies like we do from the ARDSnet studies for conventional ventilation, looking at um, outcomes for specific ventilation settings on ECMO. That evidence is starting to come, and there's some studies looking at prone positioning on ECMO, for example, which will be completed in the next couple of years. But in principle, we know that the damage that's caused by the ventilator is due to the mechanical power that's put upon the lung. And just like the analogy earlier of walking around on the broken leg, you don't want to keep bashing that lung and using 30, 35, 40 centimeters of water to try to keep it open. These are very inflamed and damaged lungs. 
So what we do is back right off. There's some evidence suggesting that keeping a peak pressure below 25 is very helpful for survival. And there's also some evidence that keeping a driving pressure around 10 to 15 is very important. So in terms of practically setting the ventilator, we do a CT at the start. We do a recruitment CT, and I'll show you some images of that later today, where we go up to an elevated pressure on the ventilator to assess the recruitability of the lungs. We keep a maximum P high, or inspiratory pressure, of 25, and a PEEP somewhere between 10 to 15, by and large, based around the recruitability of the lung. The other important thing in mechanical power is, of course, the rate. So we cut the rate right back to 10 to 15 to reduce that lung injury that's occurring. We also reduce our FiO2 because oxygen itself is very damaging to inflamed lungs. And we accept that we're looking at acceptable oxygenation. We're not looking for saturations of 100%. We've got adequate oxygenation in the 80s. So we tend to try to target the high 80s, target a normal CO2, and we use the ECMO flows, both sweep and blood gas and blood flows, uh, to manipulate systemic oxygenation. But we are very gentle with the lungs. Thank you very much. We do not have the uh, ability to do CTs before and after recruitment maneuver, so we arbitrarily pick numbers that are very similar. We try to keep the peak pressures less than 25 with very minimal tidal volumes, lower rates, lower FiO2s, and peep of around 10 to 15, like you said, and then see the response and go from there. So thank you very much. The only, the only thing I would add, if I could, so three to four mils per kilo would be nice for some of these patients, but the X-ray you saw earlier that patient's never going to have three to four mils per kilo. We have many patients at the start of ECMO who have sub-dead space ventilation. They have nothing more than a little bit of air going in and out of the trachea. So the management of those patients is complex, needs a practice team, because you've got a lot of other people involved, it's not just physicians, and you can be down to half a mil per kilo or less at times. Thank you. Next question is to Dr. Paul. So we commonly keep using the term multidisciplinary rounds, you know, most often in the healthcare system, but I know this is one time where we all actually did that, and, and I know it was not easy to get everybody in one place, so as a, as a person who has done that, could you tell us how you actually implemented this process in, in our ICU? Uh, and who are all involved, please? Yeah, thanks, Ramesh. Um, Basically what happened is we were already practicing multidisciplinary care for the transplant program. So when the ECMO program uh, kind of ev uh, evolved from the transplant program, one of the things uh, that I, I think still in some hospitals is traditionally done is uh, the critical care person rounds and or the person looking after the ECMO unit, they have to diagnose things, flag up the problem, and then get say maybe ID or a nephrologist involved who then comes in a bit later and makes the recommendation and goes away, and then maybe there's an afternoon round in which this is picked up. I personally found, at least as far as the transplant patient, and, and Ram could back me up here, is there was a big lag time between the diagnosis of uh, an infection or a kidney failure to initiation of therapy, at least as, as it was in a hospital, say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so what we did is we just made everyone come in every day uh, because we knew some of the common problems. I mean, for example, for as far as the uh, renal uh, department was concerned, you don't always have conventional things like with the pH going down or the potassium going up to start CRRT. We would just do it for volume control in these patients. And having the ECMO, you could... So therefore, the nephrologist came in every day. So from that kind of an informal setup, we uh, evolved it to have everybody come in every day. And then the primary consultant, which is either the critical care or the ECMO team, funnels that to prioritize what happens. In a, in a practical sense, this kind of helped decisions be made earlier. And I, uh, even for like transfusions and things like that, and I think that is really the core of the multidisciplinary approach. Thank you, Paul. Well, the next question here, we have two patients. Uh, one on the left, you could see that he's got an ECMO with a tracheostomy there. Uh, 
and the one on the right, both our patients, one who's extubated on ECMO without a tracheostomy. So now the next division point here is day 11 on ECMO. Patient is doing well on the rest settings that we have, we have tried. So how do you decide whether you're going to be extubating this patient or you're going to be committing this patient to a tracheostomy? Dr. Barrett, please. Um, that's, that's hard. <laughs> it, 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 it's a difficult, it, it is one of the more difficult decisions. So, so extubation, clearly you need a series of preconditions. Um, clearly the patient needs to be awake. They need to be cooperative. With COVID, we actually found that quite difficult at times. Many of the patients were really delirious, much more delirious than many of our other patients. Um, and so we did find that a challenge. You've then got the infection control aspects, particularly with something like COVID, where you're um, concerned about the staff and everybody else potentially catching the disease. So you need the patient awake, cooperative. You need them to be relaxed with a reasonable secretion burden so that they can cough and clear the secretions themselves. You need them to have not too high a work of breathing. One of the problems we saw with COVID was this enormous drive, um, respiratory drive, to, uh, on the basis of the hypoxia with very large volumes, very large inspiratory driving pressures. So that element needs to be settled down because you don't want to be introducing patient self-induced lung injury, which is such an important area for us to consider. So assuming those elements, it's useful to try to get patients extubated as soon as possible. Do we achieve it a lot? I think in all honesty, your team here achieves it more often than we do in London. Um, I think you've got such a drive because of your concerns, very valid concerns, around ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, I think you do manage to get patients extubated more, more commonly than we do. In terms of tracheostomy, the other thing to think about is complications are more common on ECMO. So many of us do uh, tracheostomies, either percutaneous or surgical, but the proportion of complications, particularly bleeding complications, on ECMO is much higher. So our incidence of bleeding for tracheostomies not on ECMO is less than 1%. Our incidence of bleeding with tracheostomies is about 20%. And so that's another really important consideration. Are you simply going to step the patient back? There are, of course, many other advantages to having the patients extubated. Oral diet, communication, ease of rehabilitation. So it's a good thing to aim for, but it can be a very complicated decision. Yeah, Dr. Paul. I, just add to the, I, I completely agree with Nick. I mean, the two things that really make the difference is the amount of secretion. And a lot of our patients, the burden of secretion is so high that you might simply have to track them just to give a reasonable toileting. Um, we'd be having a discussion about the tracheostomy a bit later, but the amount of nurses required to see an awake patient is, is far more. You require at least two, maybe even three per shift, and that's, uh, that's uh, a luxury we had uh, in, a, in the ECMO unit, and I think that's an important consideration. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Next question is to, for Dr. Purna. So on day 15 of ECMO, um, this patient has acute hemodynamic decompensation. A bedside echo showed what we actually see, a huge RA and RV. So what are the common things that you would think of as possible causes of this kind of dysfunction that acutely happens in an VV ECMO patient? And what echo objective measures do you actually look to, to monitor this and titrate your therapy? <clears throat> so uh, in such patients who are on uh, VV ECMO, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. So in a VV ECMO patient who develops acute RV dysfunction or acute um, <clears throat> you know, enlargement of the right ventricle as seen in this uh, echocardiogram, some of the things that we could think of is, is there any kind of pulmonary embolism um, or 
are their pulmonary pressures really high and do they have to be on any therapy for pulmonary vasodilation um, <clears throat> or any other acute uh, you know, infection on top of it that is causing an acute RVD compensation. So <clears throat> from an echo standpoint, uh, we look at the RV size. So RV is one of the very difficult chambers to quantify by echocardiography uh, and by so many other means as well. So <clears throat> if there is a right heart catheter that is in place already on the patient, then we calculate the pulmonary artery pulsatility index, which is also known as PAPI. Um, <clears throat> which is systolic pulmonary pressure minus the diastolic pulmonary pressure by the CVP, and that tells us the acute RV hemodynamic. Sometimes echo, you know, we can look at the RV fr fractional area change or 3D uh, volumes, <clears throat> but um, the patient who's on ECMO, uh, sometimes the images, trans thoracic images may not be adequate, so we may have to do a trans esophageal echo and look at the RA, RV, whether there is severe TR that's contributing or there is some other pulmonary pathology or pulmonary vascular pathology that is contributing um, to the picture. So we look at uh, <clears throat> the basically the pulmonary artery pressures and then the uh, IVC, we look at the hepatic veins. So we look at the waveforms to see if the TR is severe and whether we should do something, you know, diurest the patient or start them on pulmonary vasodilator therapy or if they need um, <clears throat> uh, any, you know, if there is a thromboembolism kind of picture, do they need any um, acute uh, um, therapy to lyse the clot? And also we look at the left ventricle and see whether it's underfilled or it's, you know, where the interventricular septum is, you know, when the RV is getting distended, sometimes the, it can push into the LV, whether there is tamponade physiology that's uh, happening. Um, so these are some of the things. So one is pulmonary vascular pathology. Uh, the other one is tricuspid valve or RV dysfunction per se. And then uh, any external compression like a tamponade physiology and uh, how the LV is filled. Um, <clears throat> so these are the things that we usually look at. And we look at the RA size, RV size, uh, uh, RV ejection fraction. Thank you so much, Dr. Purna. Next question is for Dr. Babu. So now that you've got this echo, this patient is in shock from, a, from what looks like a bad RV failure. What are your options in terms of trying to manage this patient uh, while on ECMO? Okay. Uh, so um, in fact, uh, RV dysfunction uh, and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension sets in in ARDS patients because of the hypoxia and the changes that happens uh, within the pulmonary system because of ARDS. And usually uh, ECMO, uh, VV or VA, depending on how bad the RV failure is, uh, is a mode of treatment. If these, uh, the heart failure from, from these changes do not subside with medical management. So um, VV ECMO by itself will help the heart, one. If it does not... Um, uh, and improve with VV ECMO, we, we have to optimize the medical therapy first. So when we say optimize the medical therapy, what we need to know is uh, hypoxia by itself can cause uh, you know, um, pulmonary vasoconstriction and ECMO is the best way to deal with it. Hypercarbia is also bad for the pulmonary system. Again, ECMO is the best way to deal with it. And even after optimizing ECMO, if you are having that, then you have to uh, go for medical therapy and optimize the uh, vasodilatory therapy. So the patient on a ventilator, I think one of the easiest thing to do would be to start inhaled nitric oxide. And it, inhaled nitric oxide has the least systemic effect compared to the other vasodilator therapy that you have. Um, uh, and uh, that would be the one Despite being on inhaled vasodilator therapy, the, the, uh, if the RV is not improving, uh, you know, we can use other vas uh, uh, vasoactive drugs. N nor adrenaline has been found to be useful. Uh, we can use levocimentin, we can use mildenone, all those can be tried to try and help the LV. But I think uh, when someone is already on VV ECMO and ha getting the best support, the RV should settle. Yes, like what Dr. Puna said, you look for other treatable causes like you know, pulmonary embolism and things like that. But if it's purely due to the ARDS, uh, if it is not improving, then 
we have to see whether the RV dysfunction is affecting the LV. If the overall cardiac output is dropping, you have an NP LV, the LV, uh, you know, afterload, uh, the preload is not, you know, being optimized, and you're having a low cardiac output and patient is shocked, then we should think of supporting the LV by using uh, an arterial support. So we are going to, uh, 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 what do you say, VA or VA, V ECMO, if, you know, for catching up time. So, that's the way you go around in algorithmic fashion to uh, support the LV. Dr. Paul, do you want to add anything yeah, else? No. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Babu. Yeah. Uh, Acute uh, RV failure. One thing to say is it, is it appears to us that RV seems to be like quite determinant. So optimizing that RV function early on is going to lead to outcomes. We have some data to that uh, effect. So it's one of the most challenging problems that we face in, in, in any ICU patient, leave alone on ECMO. Like isolated RV failure is the toughest to handle in terms of all the shocks that we see in the ICU. So just I, one thing, I, while I was just looking at the data, which is surprising, new data Professor Barrett can add on to it, was seeing is there are early studies now showing that uh, RV dysfunction with an empty LV is a poor indicator of outcome even after the patient gets decannulated from the ECMO. Uh, so there are a few studies which indicate, small studies, maybe it's worth looking at that. Do you know any, you have got any input into that, Professor Barrett? No, I think the, um, the, the right ventricle is absolutely far more important than it was considered to be when I was at medical school, when we were, we were which was a little while ago now, but we were told all the time, oh, it's just a conduit. Just, just ignore it. An RV infarct, leave them. A few weeks later, it'll fibrose up and, and you're fine. No, not at all. Mm. It, it's, it's an essential, absolutely essential, and you're absolutely right. There is sort of an evolving field of evidence looking at the importance of the right heart and the importance of managing the right heart uh, in both acutely as well as chronically for these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bader. Next question is uh, for Dr. Ram Gopalakrishnan, our ID specialist. These patients are not like the typical ICU patients that you would see, uh, and there are so many other factors that kind of confound your diagnosis of sepsis. So when you see these patients, what are some of the challenges you have in first identifying sepsis, and number two, when you think it is sepsis, does your empiric antibiotic choice change in this population compared to a regular med surge ICU population? Yeah, so sepsis is always a challenge to diagnose because many of these patients don't mount a febrile or inflammatory response. You just have to pay close attention to what the, the, the team is telling you regarding the hemodynamics. Is there worsening oxygenation? Is there, uh, is there a falling blood pressure? Is there some unexplained metabolic acidosis? Have the platelets dropped? Has the PCT bumped up? Are there increased secretions? These are all clinical things that tell you rather than conventional uh, fever, etc. All of these patients have an elevated white count because there is some inflammation going on somewhere. So the first thing to do is to have a high index of suspicion. And as soon as you suspect sepsis, uh, the, the most important test here is a blood culture. And when I say blood culture, it means a high volume blood culture. You need to culture at least 40 ml of blood in two sets of uh, blood cultures. And, and I feel one of the reasons we have done well in treating sepsis in these patients is we are culturing them properly. It's just, it's just uh, it's taken for granted that we do these cultures in adequate volumes, etc. So after you send off your cultures, your empiric antibiotic choice is based upon two things. One is what is the, the antibiogram or what is the local prevalence of resistance in your unit, in your hospital, and then in your ECMO unit. And secondly, what have they been exposed to? So it's not very difficult. For instance, if someone has been on a carbapenem, you would think of a carbapenem resistant infection. If somebody is admitted in our ICU where we tend to see a lot of resistance in our gram negatives, including carbapenem resistance, there'll be a short presentation on the, on the profile of resistance a little bit later. You automatically will have to start with something that covers, say, carbapenem resistant gram negative bacilli. And Candida, Candida is an important player in this population. Most of them have been through courses of steroids or other immunomodulatory agents. All of them have multiple vascular access device, the ECMO device, central lines, dialysis lines, and all of them would have been exposed to antibiotics. So Canada is sometimes covered right at the start, right off the bat. Uh, 
So if you keep these things in mind, you could devise an appropriate empiric antimicrobial regimen, which is always started on day one, immediately after sending off your blood cultures. These are not patients in whom you would wait for reports or wait and see if the patient is settling down, etc. Thank you so much, RJK, for that very clear and detailed answer. Next is uh, the same patient here who we did tracheostomy. This is something Dr. Barrett had mentioned earlier. So this is day 26 on ECMO. Now he's got profuse oozing from the tracheostomy site, and as you can see, oozing from all the line sites and, and the mucosal membranes. So what are the, some of the common causes of these kinds of coagulopathy that happens on the VV ECMO patients, Dr. Barrett? Dr. Barrett? So what are some of the common causes of these kinds of bleeding manifestations that happen while you're on ECMO? So, so we, indeed, bleeding is incredibly common on ECMO. Bleeding, but also clotting. So we have a completely deranged coagulation system. Now, partially, that's our fault, because we're giving heparin usually, or argatroban or bivalirudin, or whatever anticoagulant you use. We tend to use heparin in the main. Um, we then need to be able to target heparin properly. Um, I'm not a hematologist, but certainly the measurement of heparin levels is crucial because ACT, whilst it gives us whole blood clotting time, doesn't really give us a measure of heparin effect. APTT is a little bit more like a scatter plot, unfortunately, when it comes to, to measuring heparin impact. We've moved, migrated to 10A levels, um, and clearly if we're using direct thrombin inhibitors, then we use 2A levels. The other big impact is, of course, the underlying disease. Sepsis per se impacts coagulation with thrombocytopenia and the development of DIC, but also the pump. So you've got two things with, with ECMO. You've got the large exposure to a foreign surface, which results in a lot of both adsorption, where the platelets and the um, clotting proteins are sticking into the surface of the membrane. You get activation of the platelets in particular as they're going through the centrifugal pump and then later on through the membrane. And you also get um, an impact with um, things like von Willebrand's factor, where we know that the von Willebrand's factor, which normally exists in very high molecular weight multimers, as it spins through the centrifugal pump, its cleavage points are um, able to be accessed, it spreads out, and then we end up with lots of low molecular weight multimers, which again increases the propensity to bleeding. And you then, because you've also got that foreign surface and you're likely to get thrombosis, particularly within the membrane, that in turn can trigger further disorders of clotting with the development of a DIC-like syndrome where you get a progressive thrombocytopenia and hypofibrinogenemia due to the circuit itself, and that in turn can promote bleeding. So it's, it's a very complex hematological environment, and a lot more research is required into better understanding and improving the tools. What I can say is that the higher the volume of the center, so the more you get used to looking after these patients, the less serious issues with bleeding that you get. You can still get bleeding, of course, we all can. But we see fewer episodes of serious bleeding now that we're running about 100 to 150 patients a year than when we were running 10 to 15. And that's just because we, and I mean the whole team, is much better at managing the cases in a higher volume center. Thank you so much. So next question again uh, to Dr. RGK, infectious disease. What are some of the rare infections or weird bugs that you have seen are there any uh, particular bacteria that you would strongly recommend saying this patient's ECMO cannula is probably the source and needs to be changed or removed? No. Are there any bugs that kind of mandate that kind of uh, approach? 
Yeah, rare infections are quite common. Uh, you'll see a short presentation on this a little bit later, so I'll leave it uh, for that. Specific infections when removal of ECMO cannula would be ideal. If it were left to me, I would remove the ECMO cannula all the time, <laughs> but I never win that, win that battle with them. So, uh, so you'll have to try and treat through many of these infections when in other hosts, the job is easy, just pull out the foreign body. See, these organisms produce biofilm. They adhere to whatever you put in their circulation, the cannula, the lines, etc. So they're often difficult to treat if you leave the, uh, the foreign body with the biofilm on it, but um, you have to treat through them. Uh, typically fungal infections, typically uh, drug-resistant gram-negative bacilli, non-fermenters, which are often commensals in the ICU, if they get into the patient, they often adhere to the central lines. You'll again see a short uh, presentation of some of these a bit later. Without taking the wind away from the next presentation, this is just for amusement value that these are all the bugs names that I learned for the first time working in that ICU. I've never heard of them before, and I've never heard of them after. So, so I'll wait for the presentation. They, they keep changing the names too frequently. <laughs> so sometimes I hear of them for I the first time. I know you guys so. have, a, have a mafia that are doing that. So I have two patients here. This question is for Dr. Uh, uh, Nick and uh, maybe Paul. So both patients admitted with bad COVID pneumonia. The CT scans are about nine months apart. Patient one here looks like he's nicely recovered and almost ready to go home. The second patient here, CT doesn't really change. So it becomes very tricky. Both are nine months apart. So the question is, are there any indicators where I can say this person is probably not going to do well, this person is going to do well? Are there any predictors that we could use to, to kind of, uh, you know, figure out what's, hap what's going to happen to them six months down the line or nine months down the line? Um, I, again, I think this is, this is a difficult area. Um, limitation of, of care or, or even withdrawal of therapy um, is always part of critical care. Um, when we reach the point where either our friends in transplant can't help can't help or the patient can't recover, then we do need to think about these things honestly. What we've seen, particularly with COVID, is that this is not a short run. So for us over the years, we've been able to relatively confidently predict run length. Someone with acute asthma, three to five days, they come on, the spasm breaks and, and they move on. Someone with flu, 10 to 14 days. Somebody with overwhelming sepsis, say group A strep, again, around, around the 10 day mark. COVID was harder. So what we saw in the early phases of COVID, we were seeing similar run lengths, about 10 to 20 days. And those patients who were steroid naive, if we go all the way back to April 2020, tended to respond very well to steroids. We then come more recently to patients who've been vaccinated or who've had um, significant steroids, remdesivir, etc. Those run lengths, on average, are looking at 20 to 30 days. And it takes quite a practice team to manage patients for that length of time. But in terms of the duration, time is but a number. And you need to be able to see and assess whether the patient's improving. We'll talk a little bit about how we can assess the native respiratory function and the impact, the ability of the lungs to work, because the CTs, whilst helpful, are just a picture. They don't talk to the underlying physiology and the lung function. So you need to wait long enough to make sure that there is no reasonable prospect of recovery and that transplant, for example, or domiciliary ventilation um, are not options for those patients. I guess Paul particularly. That's exactly right. I mean, um, two things. I mean, these, these cases are very illustrative because both of them roughly spent the same amount of time on ECMO and uh, both are about the same age, but uh, clearly one has uh, improved to the point where she leads a normal life and the other required a transplant. We have been looking at a few things. Uh, uh, there is an abstract in the making uh, 
none of the conventional risk factors that we currently use for ECMO and outcomes appears to indicate uh, in this cohort of patients who's going to come out of it and who's not. But there may be other areas of uh, uh, gas exchange as well as compliance and right ventricular echo indices early on or at admission that might, through a mathematical model, at least tell us where we should be looking for the prognostic signs. So, uh, as Nick said, it's, it's uh, in the process. It's something we have to learn as we go along. So the last question is for Dr. Paul. You counsel these patients every day, right? I'm sure they're not the straightforward ICU. Yeah, ICU patient counseling is demanding, and I'm sure with so much uncertainty and yes. prolonged course and the costs involved with yes. it, it's going to be really tough to counsel those patients. So what are some of the challenges that you've had to face in counseling these patients and families? Yeah, I, I think you uh, enumerated all the things. There's the uncertainty element, there is the cost element, and there's the high amount of, uh, you know, the, especially in COVID, these are patients who've been well and may have been the earning member of the family and suddenly they're laid low and the costs are just mounting up and you can't give them a guarantee. So we talk to them every day. Uh, I think uh, what we have found during the counseling sessions is you uh, have to articulate this uncertainty very clearly. We don't know what's gonna happen. Is he gonna get better? Is he gonna die? Today is a bad day, today is a good day. Is transplant. Uh, we find that um, as you talk to them, uh, they do understand what's happening. As far as, and we have separate counseling for the medical aspect as well as the financial aspect where we try to connect them up with crowdfunding agencies and sometimes we have found that they're actually the insurance works, the employee insurance works, which they didn't know about and they're trying to deal with all these things at the same time. So it is very, very important. I cannot overemphasize how important it is to talk to these patients every day. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, all the panelists. Just three or four take-home points for the audience is these patients are extremely complex and they're going to need meticulous monitoring and the decision-making has to be customized. I don't think we can have an algorithm for every decision that we make. They're all multi-system involved patients and therefore we need a very cohesive multidisciplinary team. We don't agree on all the decisions all the time, but we are very cohesive and we work towards it because we do understand that our views are only to get the patient better and that probably helps the outcomes overall. We need to understand that the course is extremely variable and unpredictable and we need to have very good round the clock medical support for these patients for, for good success. So it's more than the cannulas and the machines. I think it's a lot more work that goes beyond it. And I want to thank all the experts here for, for their valuable inputs and, and their thoughts. So thank you so much.